Hello, everyone. This is Grandmaster Varusha Nakobian um, with ICC, and I would like to present you videos on a Grunfeld defense, and uh, especially a specific violation that I've been playing against the Grunfeld with white pieces. And today I would like to show you one of my games played at a recent chorus tournament in a big group. And this was the last round of the tournament, and my opponent is Grandmaster David Howell from England. And uh, I used this very interesting system and uh, was able to win the game. And I would like to show you the game with analysis here. So, d4, knight f6, c4, g6, and Grunfeld. For many years, Grunfeld defense has been a problem for me because it's always... Uh, I didn't know which opening to play because the theory is constantly changing. And I've played uh, several different lines against it. And uh, recently, maybe about six months ago, I decided that I want to try this particular system. And I already played a couple of games with some good results. So in this series of the videos on a group on defense, I will be introducing you to this specific line. So I took 95 e4, knight c3. So far we're following one of the main lines of the Grunfeld. The c5, and here, here I've tried, um, I've tried rook b1 move here, and I've played a couple of interesting games with this line, and, uh, but the theory is, again, it's very unclear here. Uh, white, uh, white constantly needs to follow the theory here to see if uh, their white has any advantage here or not. So that's why I wanted to try a new system, which is bishop e3, queen a5, queen d2. Idea behind queen a5 is to put pressure on c3, and after queen d2, uh, white is ready. So in case of a capture, he can take back with the pawn, and if queen takes d2, white can play king takes d2. And this kind of end games are considered slightly better for white because he can put his rook on a c file, develop his bishop on d3, and then simply put the king back on e2. So for something like castle, rook c1, e6, bishop goes on d3. And then white will move the king on e2 and will simply double up the rooks on the, on the c file and will have a slight advantage here. So this is, this is the plan for white in this position. But uh, of course black has more active options here rather than just taking on c4, which my opponent played here. He played knight c6. Idea behind this move is just simply to put pressure on d4 here. Here, uh, white has two options here, either to play rook c1 or rook b1 here. I decided to, to choose the rook b1 move in this position. Idea behind rook b1 is simply to play rook b5, attacking the queen and winning the pawn on c5. And here, uh, black has a couple of options here. One of the options is to play a6 in order to prevent rook b5. But after a6, then rook goes back to c1. And now, after the exchange on d4, Queen takes d4, king d2. The difference is, is the b6 square is weak here in this position. So the b6 square is weak. So if castle, for example, then bishop d3, and then follow it up with king d2, d5, and bishop b6 can be played, controlling the b6 square and, and also the dark squares as well, the c7 and the d8 square. But in this game, my opponent decided to go for the main line, and castle. Other moves are also possible, but the castle is very interesting here. Basically, after castle here, black has to sacrifice the queen after rook b5. Because now, if he just moves the queen away, for example, queen c7, then just rook takes c5. And white is up upon here without any compensation. So that's why when rook b5, he played c takes d4. Uh, when I was uh, preparing to play against my opponent in this tournament, and uh, I, I saw that you know he's gonna he might be he might be playing this line because he had another game that he played exactly like this, and uh, I did a little bit of research on this uh, particular line and find out that you know I think white is still a little bit better here even though black has a good compensation here. Rook takes a5, I take the queen, and now intermediate move d takes e3, attacking the queen. I have to take queen takes e3 because for example if play queen d5. In order to support the rook, in case knight takes, queen takes, bishop c3 check, and then bishop takes a5. And black is going to be much better now. So queen takes c3 is important, and now knight takes a5. And now we reach this very interesting position here where uh, basically white has a material advantage here. He has a queen versus bishop and rook. Uh, but at the same time, you know, black has a pair of the bishops, uh, the target only three, so... 
things things are not looking that simple here for White, even though he has a material advantage here. So it's very important in this position to play precise moves. The first precise move is Knight d4. Centralizing the Knight and also preventing the Bishop, you know, from putting pressure on c3. And of course, in this type of positions, Black is never going to give up his Bishop, like capturing the Knight. But another key idea behind Knight d4 is to simply control the e6 square, because if, let's say, I play any other move, Bishop e2, after Bishop e6, Black is putting pressure here. Okay? So that's why. It's important to play Knight takes d4. Now Bishop d7. You know, Black needs to develop his bishop so he can get the connection between the rooks. So this guy plays bishop d7 first. e5. Another important move is to completely shut down the dark square bishop because dark square bishop is a strong piece. And after playing e5, the bishop is going to be blocked here. And uh, it's not going to be that much pressure on that diagonal anymore. Um, white, white doesn't have to rush with the development because the position is closed here and it's not going to be open immediately. f4. E5, and now he played rook fc8. Uh, just a standard move, putting pressure on c3. And here again, f4. Strengthening the e5 pawn, and in case the, the queen moves, we don't have to worry about the e5 pawn hanging here. So that's the idea behind f4, to simply control the e5 square and keep the dark square bishop uh, blocked as, as long as possible. Because if this bishop is blocked, then it's much easier to play this position for white. Now, Rook c7. Uh, there are many other moves in this position. For example, knight c4 move um, is a very logical move. It seems like he can go there. But this is after this move, after queen e4, it's a problem. How to defend the b7 pawn? Because now if rook c7, for example, I just take on c4, rook takes c4, queen b7, attacking the rook and a bishop here. So that's why knight c4, queen e4, it's not so clear. It's not so clear how to defend the pawn on b7. So that's not too good. I was also expecting maybe him to play e6, because it seems like this move is needed to control uh, some squares, prevent the e6 push, and later on black has this possibility to activate his bishop. But against this move, I was planning to play the active h4, bishop here, h5, and planning to use the queen and open up the h-file. I believe... I believe white has a very good attacking chances here. This is a little bit unusual position here. You know, white doesn't have to worry about castling immediately because at some point I can play h4, h5, and if there is a strong pressure on c3, I can even use rook h3 here to defend on c3. So if e6, I was planning e6, I was planning to play that. So my opponent played rook c7. Now he wants to go here, and this way I don't have h4 and rook h3 because his bishop is guarding this. So rook c7, and now bishop b5. This is an important move here because he's about to double up the pawns, and then I'm going to have to to do something to defend against this threat. So that's why I figure I want to play bishop b5, exchange one bishop here. This way also I eliminate the advantage of black having pair of the bishops. So if I can exchange one bishop, then it's going to be good. So bishop b5, now knight c6. Um... Good move here, I believe, because if he plays any other move like rook c8, then I just take. If rook takes d7, e6. Strong move, attacking the rook. If take, just queen e6 check, winning a rook. And uh, if bishop takes d4 or anything, I can also do the intermediate capture of the rook and also attacking another rook here. So white is clearly better here. So... When I play bishop b5, he played knight c6. Also, the knight is on the side of the board, so he's not uh, doing a very good job there. But now, it's going to be a couple of exchanges here. I decided to take bishop c6, bishop c6, knight c6, rook c6. And we arrive in this, this important position here, because it looks like white is better here. But uh, the question is if this is going to be enough to win the game, because black just wants to play b6 and just simply put pressure here on c3. For example, if I castle, this is not going to be a good move because he just he can just play e6, and uh, next he's going to play bishop f8, and bishop c5 is coming up. And uh, I'm going to have to also worry about this weakness on c3 here. And that's why, even though material-wise white is better here, but it's going to be very difficult to create winning chances. 
So that's why I played here king e2. This is already an it's just kind of an end game already here. That's why it's important to have the king in the in the center, closer to the weakness on c3, because at some point it's going to be easier to use the king to defend that weakness here. And also now I want to bring my rook into the game. If I castle here, my king is going to be on the king side, far away from my pawns here. So that's why it's important to keep the king in the middle. Again, I have a queen on the board, but this is this position is like an end game. So now my opponent played b6. Now I play rook d1, rook a c8, putting pressure on c3, and this gives me enough time to play this move, rook d3. Uh, let's go back few moves and take a look at one possibility here. Uh, the reason I spent time here, I spent about 30 minutes here uh, to realize which move I want to make before, before trading everything on c6, because I was worried about the rook a6 move here. But the rook a6, I realized I just play queen d2, controlling the d file and also defending my weakness. And now if he plays rook c8, I play rook b1 with the tempo, attacking on b7. If he plays b6, now I play rook b4. And this way now I have an active rook on a d file. So it's a clearly a, a better position for me. And the rook is on a6, it's, it's unclear whether or not it's doing anything there. So he's going to have to bring it back to the c file here. So I don't think black really accomplishes anything. That's why my opponent, the Grandmaster Howell, played b6 here. Because he cannot play rook a c8 immediately because a7 pawn is hanging. Because I will take, he takes, then I will just go here. And basically what happened is I exchanged my weak pawn on c3 with a good pawn on a7. And now b7 is weak and if he checks, I can just go rook d2. And after the exchange, I will win the b7 pawn and a pawn will win the game. So that's why I played b6, which is the correct move in this position. Rook d1. But uh, this b6 move gave me time to play rook d1, rook a c8, rook d3. And I was happy to reach this position because here I protected my uh, weak pawn from the side rather than from behind the pawn. Because if I would have put my rook on a c1, then my rook would be very passive. But here my rook is actually combining two ideas. Defending the weak pawn and also controlling the d-file. Now my plan is actually to put the king on c2 and then play queen d2 and try to activate my rook on the seventh rank. This is my plan here. After I did this here, my opponent spent a lot of time here trying to find out what to do. Uh, and he came up with a good move here, f6. This is his best chance because he needs to activate his bishop. For example, if he plays e6, I just play queen d2, h5, rook d8 check, rook d8, queen d8 check, bishop f8, now king d3, defending the weak pawn. a5 he plays, now I play a4, fixing the pawns on the queen side, king g7, queen d7, now attacking on the rook, rook c5, and now c4. And white is winning after c4 because now his rook is actually trapped. And my next move is simply to play here and win the pawn on b6. And the rook on c5 has absolutely no squares to go to. So if, if, if he could somehow put his bishop on c5 here and activate his rook, this is going to be a draw. But here he cannot do that. After queen b7, he will lose the b6 pawn. For example, if he goes here, it looks like he can still try to claim it's a fortress, but he cannot because I have king d4. Now I'm ready already to sacrifice my queen and I will win because of the c pass pawn. And if he goes back, I can advance the pawn already. Check, king goes here. There is no danger of having the king um, on c4 on the middle of the board here because black doesn't have that many pieces. And the most important thing is he doesn't have a queen. So that's why he cannot really do a perpetual or anything else. So, so that's why in this position my opponent decided to play f6, which, which first I was surprised. I thought it's a bad move because it's weakening the position a little bit. But in fact, I realized later on, and when I checked with the computer, the computer also recommended this. This was the first line of the computer because... If he plays passive with e6, most likely he's going to lose. There is, no, there is no fortress. But after f6, 
also I have some, some chances here, but at least he can try to activate his pieces here. So here after f6, I have to play a very strong move here, because otherwise he's going to try to open up the position, and um, f takes e, f takes e, and then rook c5, and I have, I'm going to have some problems with this pawn. And if I play e6, which looks like a natural and tempting move to do, it looks like it's going to be a strong pawn. In fact, it's not, because after f5, I will lose my pawn on c3, and then he can just play king g7, and it's, uh, black, is, black is just fine here. In fact, he might be even better here. Just play bishop f6, g3, bishop f6, king g7, and then he can even take on c3. So, so that's why when he played f6, I had to play this move, queen e4, which is a strong move. Idea behind this move is I knew that he's going to capture on e5. My idea is to play f5. Even though I sacrifice a pawn here, but I would like to keep his dark square bishop blocked here, behind this pawn here, because if this bishop comes in into the game, then he's going to have more chances to make a draw. So that's why I wanted to play f5 here. Now, he played g5. Uh, g5, I believe, is a mistake. His best chance is to capture queen takes f5 and take the pawn on c3. Even though I think this position is probably very difficult to defend, but this is his best chance because at least he has a little bit more material here. My plan here is going to be try to advance my pawns, you know, with g5 and h5 and try to uh, create mating threats here. Uh, white has still very good winning chances, but again, this is the best defense for black. Now you play g5. And after this move, um, I have two good options here. Of course, the most natural option is to play rook d8 because this way I can exchange and have a very active exchange of rooks and have a very active queen. But I was a little bit afraid, you know, of some positions like this where he can uh, claim some kind of fortress, you know, position where I cannot uh, break through. But the further analysis showed that probably I can also break through this position here. But um, uh, during the game it's more difficult to go for such a position because it looks like black is defending everything. So that's why in this position I decided to go with a very interesting and I believe a strong energetic move H4. Because g5 created the weakness, that's why I play h4, putting pressure on g5. Now he takes, queen takes h4, putting pressure on e7, and also now the king is exposed, and also threatening to play rook g3, rook g3 and rook h3 ideas. Now he plays bishop f6, which I was expecting, because he needs to control the e7 pawn. Now... The next couple of moves are very important to make for white because that's the only way I can have advantage. Rook g3 check, forcing the king to go back to h8 because if he goes to the f file, I can win the pawn on h7. And now here, the key move is queen h6. Looks like I'm losing the pawn on c3, but by playing queen h6, in fact, I stop rook c3 because if he takes on c3, I capture, he captures rook c3, queen f8 checkmate. That's why this move is strong because now, I have a strong threat of playing rook h3 and checkmate my opponent from h7. So that's my threat now. He found the only move, rook g8. Now, if I play rook h3, this is not going to do anything because he just plays rook g7 and defending against the threats. Now, next move, he will play e4 and activate his dark square bishop. Okay, so that's why I take. King takes. And now in this position... The only way I can win this game is if I start advancing my g-pawn and push on g5. My king is very well placed on e2. That was also another idea when I play king e2. I put the king on the light square, so there is no discovery checks in the future with the dark square bishop here or any other checks. So I play g4 here, now sacrificing my second pawn, which he takes, and now g5. But uh, I don't have that many pawns left, so there is a danger of a fortress position here. Now my opponent played a good move here. He played rook c6. This is the best defense. He has to sacrifice his bishop here. Because, for example, if he plays bishop e7, this move is g7 is losing immediately. Queen e6 check. If king f8, I just play g6. Captures, captures. If he goes here, king d1. Rook f2 defending against a threat from f7, but getting checkmated from c8. And if he plays here king h8, just queen e7. Now threatening checkmate. If he goes back, then continue pushing the f-pawn. So 
white is white is clearly winning in this position here he has to go here and take another pawn and nothing really black can do in this position so that's why he decided to sacrifice the bishop which is the right move here but here I have to play a very strong move for example if I just take the bishop which is tempting he plays rook f6 queen h4 he plays h6 queen g3 check king f8 queen takes a5 he just plays a5 and this position is a fortress even though I have a queen versus rook but I cannot make a progress because black just gonna play rook d6 and rook f6 He's just basically going to go back and forth with the rook. Yes, I can give him a couple of checks, but the problem is my king has no entry point. And that's why I cannot uh, win this position, because I don't have any breakthroughs with the pawns, and I don't have that many pawns left anymore here. So that's why I, I realized the danger of the fortress, and came up with a very important and a strong move in this position. Queen h1, attacking the rook. There is no rush to take the bishop immediately because it's very important for me to win the a7 pawn. The a7 pawn is the key in this position. If I win the a7 pawn, then he doesn't have a fortress. So queen h1 is going to give me that intermediate move that before taking the bishop. So I can win the a7 pawn. If he plays check, I just go here. If he takes on a2, this position is just losing. Takes, takes, queen d5 check winning the rook. So that's why my opponent played rook d6 because when I capture on f6 he has to capture back with the rook. So I took rook f6 and now before he plays a5 and defends the a7 pawn I play queen a8 check king f7 queen a7. Very important to win the pawn. My opponent I think perhaps thought he's still this position is a fortress here but in fact I have a winning pawn here. Rook d6, queen a8, h6. Now I improve my king to the center because I want to win the pawn on e5. King e3, rook d4. Now I go back queen h8, attacking the pawn on h6. He goes back rook d6, defending it. Now king, I can play queen takes e5 here, but my queen is actually very well placed on h8, so I want to use my king to do that. Now rook check. King takes rook d6, and now we reach the first time control. And uh, here I already saw the path to the victory here. And the move is here a4. Fixing the weak pawn on b6, and it's very important to have my a pass pawn advanced here. You will see the winning plan now, and the reason why I need the pawn on a4. He goes rook c6, now I play king d4, now he plays rook f6. Attacking the pawn on f5, I go queen c8, defending the pawn on f5 here, and now my opponent decided to play h5, which, which, which is losing immediately. But let me show you the winning plan here. If he plays rook d6, the winning plan is king c4, rook f6, king b5, rook d6, and now I can even play queen e6 check. Queen, rook takes e6, pawn takes e6, king e6, king takes b6. And now, when we start advancing our pawns, my pawn is actually one step quicker. And it's very important when I put the queen on a8, I control the h1 square so he cannot queen. That's the idea why I have to have my pawn on a4. So when the pawn race starts, my pawn is one step quicker. And here, it's a Luckily for me, when I queen, I stopped his uh, pawn. Because if his pawn was on a g-file, this entire position would have been a draw. So that's why it's important that his pawn is on a h-file. Queen e6 is just a nice idea, but also I can do the same exact idea, just queen b8 and queen b6. Losing the a5 pawn is not really important if, let's say, I play here, he gives me a check and takes this pawn, because now my a-pass pawn will win the game here. So either I can play queen e6 idea or just queen b8, queen b6, and we start advancing our pawns, but my pawn is queening on a8 and controlling the h1 square. So that's why I think my opponent realized at this point he is just uh, losing. So after queen c8, he decided to play h5. You know, he was hoping that when, when I do the same idea, his pawn will be quicker. But the problem with h5 is now he will be simply losing this pawn. I play king e5, 
defending my d5 pawn. Now I place rook h6 because if he goes rook d6, I just go here and winning the pawn on h5. If he pushes, I just play queen check again, winning the pawn here. So after you push h5, he's going to lose the pawn. So he decided to go here and here. There are many ways how to win, but the most precise move here, and I like this move here, queen c1. And it's like a team in this game. Once I played queen h6 to h1, a long move, and I went to a8, and here, queen c1. The final move of this game, attacking the rook. Here, my opponent resigned immediately, because if he goes to d6, after queen g5, I'm just winning the pawn, and I can come back to the same idea of sacrificing on b6, but here, I don't even have to worry about the h-pass pawn, because I'm just winning it. And if he, if he tries to go to h8, I play queen g5, h4, queen g6 check, king f8, king e6, and queen f7 checkmate. And uh, that's the reason why my opponent resigned. And uh, this was the last round of the chorus tournament. I was happy to win this game and by using this specific uh, opening. Uh, th this is the game number one of our video series with ICC on a Grunfeld defense. And there uh, will be more videos. And this is Grandmaster Ruzhin Akobian. I hope you enjoy this video on a Grunfeld defense. Thank you.